It's one of those nights when you're in and out of sleep. At some point, your eyes pop open and you attempt to move, but your arms and legs just won't cooperate. You glance at the door and suddenly a man wearing a hat walks in. But you can't see his eyes, nose, or mouth. Only darkness. He approaches and you can tell that he's staring at you. No, it's not a nightmare. There is actually a very real explanation for this terrifying intruder. The story about a mysterious hat man that haunts your sleep has been circulating on the internet since the late 2000s. People from all over the world describe this being as a silhouette of a tall man that looks solid. I mean, he's not a typical shadowy figure. Some claim to have seen him wearing old-fashioned clothes like a trench coat or a cape. And apparently, this guy has a thing for hats because he's already been spotted using a top hat, a fedora, or a gaucho hat. It depends on his mood, I guess. When he's finally done creeping into your bedroom, he doesn't just vanish. He actually uses the door, either walking or gliding through it. Okay, so he likes fancy clothes and quite dramatic exits. But who exactly is the hat man? Some people believe he's a dark entity while others are convinced he's some kind of interdimensional being. Well, no matter which theory you buy into, one thing's for sure, he ain't here to be your best buddy. And contrary to popular belief, science suggests that he's actually your own mind. The hat man usually shows up at night when you're sort of half asleep and half awake. And his shadow figure feels real because in a way, he is real especially if we think of him as one of the possible effects of sleep paralysis. This sensation of being awake but unable to move or speak affects between 25 and 50% of Americans at least once in their lives. We all go through two sleep phases, REM and NREM. In REM sleep, our brain gets all active. But at the same time, the body experiences muscle atonia, a temporary paralysis of all the muscles except for the ones controlling breathing and the eyes. This means that sleep paralysis is totally expected. It only becomes a problem when it happens outside of REM sleep. In this case, there's a lack of synchrony between changes in brain activity. Like your brain is saying, wakey-wakey, but your muscles think you're still in a deep sleep phase. If you ever get this creepy feeling, Try not to stress too much because it usually only sticks around for a few seconds. The trouble starts when these episodes drag on for minutes, leading to hallucinations. And one specific type of these trippy and dreamlike situations is called the intruder. Sometimes it appears only in the form of a presence, like you're being watched, but you can't see anyone around you. Other times, this hallucination makes you see or hear something scary, similar to the hat man. Oh, and by the way, it's time to tell you what happens when the hat man decides to sneak into someone's room. Well, he stares. He keeps staring. And then he leaves. So, in essence, he doesn't really do anything. But there is a reason why his staring is actually one of the most frightening situations you could ever experience. Sleep researchers argue that if we wake up paralyzed and vulnerable, our instincts would naturally make us feel threatened, so our mind fills in the gaps. And this instinctual response was extremely important for our evolution. See, from the survival point of view, feeling as if you're being watched allows you to better assess any threats. So that's why we have a threat-activated vigilance system that keeps us alert when facing an uncertain, hidden, or partially obscured threat. During sleep paralysis, you wake up and see only darkness around you. Plus, your body can't move. So this protection mechanism kicks in, making you think, well, if I'm the prey, there must be a predator. Behind the scenes, this mechanism increases the sensitivity of the cerebral cortex and creates false positives in the form of hallucinations. In other words, you perceive a threat when there's absolutely nothing to fear and there's nothing actually staring at you. Nowadays, hallucinations may manifest in the form of the hat man. However, stories from the past also include descriptions of hairy monsters, hooded figures with red eyes, witches, or werewolves. Aside from causing a disturbing feeling, at least these bedroom intruders don't really do anything, unlike other creatures that might visit you during sleep. Let's head to Southeast Brazil. 
But be careful. If you come across Pisadera there, run! Oops, my mistake. Meeting her means you're already paralyzed. There's nothing you can do except hope she leaves your bedroom as soon as possible. Pisadera is a famous Brazilian tale of an old woman with long fingernails who lurks on the roofs at night and tramples on the chest of those who sleep with full bellies and their stomachs up. She sits on people's bellies and puts pressure on their thorax, causing them to struggle to catch their breath. Although Pisadera is Brazilian, the creature represents something that seems to be a universal phenomenon that's been occurring since antiquity. The Pisadera embodies another type of hallucination you can have during sleep paralysis, known as the incubus phenomenon. The creature may take on the form of a human, animal, or a metaphysical being that puts pressure on people's chests. It might seem like a rare occurrence, but researchers have found that over 1 in 10 people will experience it at least once in their lifetimes. So let's hope you're not that one, because this experience can be extremely disturbing. And there's a reason for it. According to research, sleep paralysis triggers an overactivation of the amygdala, you know, the part of the brain responsible for recognizing and processing fear. So if it's highly active, you'll experience common fear-related reactions like difficulty breathing or cold sweats. Yep, it seems like we've just uncovered why Pisadera is so frightening. Scientists might also have answers on why people feel like she's actually touching them. In 2014, a group of scientists discovered how to make people feel a mysterious presence around them by disrupting their sensory expectations. They've basically figured out how to trick participants into believing they're actually touching their own backs by synchronizing their movements with a robot positioned right behind them. Here's how it worked. Everything was perfectly in sync, and the brains of the participants combined the signals from their movements and the sensations on their backs into one unified experience. However, when these scientists disrupted the robot's synchronization by slowing it down, for example, people suddenly started feeling like someone else was touching their backs. It was as if they were feeling ghostly touches. So, this experiment can provide some clues about why people have the sensation of being touched during sleep paralysis. When our sensory information is all messed up, we may mistakenly interpret the sensation as someone pressing down on our chest when, in fact, it's just our own mind playing tricks on us. Roughly 75% of people who experience sleep paralysis will also experience hallucinations, which make creatures like the Hat Man or the Pisadera look incredibly real. This can happen due to factors such as stress, anxiety, lack of sleep, and post-traumatic stress disorder. But some things may help you deal with these scary experiences. Make sure you get enough sleep, about 7-9 to nine hours per day. Try to reduce stress by doing activities like reading a book or meditating before bedtime. Also, some researchers associate sleep paralysis with sleeping on your back. If that's your case, consider trying new positions. This way you'll likely turn your worst nightmare into a bedtime g- Yes, you did it! You managed to do that lucid dream thing, you know, when you're dreaming and can suddenly become aware of yourself. You can do anything you want in those dreams, have magical powers, move things with your mind, ride a flying bike, fish while sitting on a small cloud. Awesome! But, yes, unfortunately, there's a but. No matter how epic the world of dreams may seem, there are a few things you might want to avoid. You're in a house, but you're not sure if you're dreaming or not. There's a road, a thick forest behind it, and this house. Hmm. The house is old, but very neat and clean. Now, you're standing in a long hallway. To your left, there's a beautiful retro-looking living room. Why not check it out? The sunlight's gently seeping through the curtains. It looks magical. Red vintage sofas, a thick green rug, a coffee table, two big bookcases, an old piano in the corner, plants near the windows. Hmm, who wanders those if no one lives here? Ah, never mind. Hey, check out this standing mirror right next to the piano. Slowly, step by step, you start walking toward it, wondering what you're going to see. And stop right there. 
The first rule of lucid dreaming is to try to avoid doing activities that make you feel too emotional. The mirror might reflect a different and pretty distorted version of yourself. You might not like what you see. What if it's someone else looking back at you? Or you realize your hands are unnaturally long, your face is unrecognizable, or there's someone standing behind you. A mirror in a dream is definitely the worst way to find that out, so try to resist this temptation. Once you're a lucid dream pro, you can give it a try. Now, you move on, checking out other things in the house. Suddenly, a thought pops into your mind. If this is a dream, where's your real body? No, don't go down that road. Try not to think about your body. If you do, you risk losing focus. The house will vanish and you'll wake up. Once you're in a lucid dream, you should try to pay attention to your surroundings. Anything else, especially thinking of yourself lying in bed, Bye-bye. Better luck next time. Okay, you're still in the house, focused on the things in the living room, not on your body. Time to move on. Check out some of the other… Wait, stop. You suddenly became very aware that you're in a creepy old house all by yourself. Why did you go in? What were you thinking? You start to feel extremely uncomfortable. What if someone lives here? So far, you've only been in the living room. You turn around and go back to the hall. Okay, the door you came in through is still there, but there are some wooden stairs over there. You can't quite see where they lead to. Did it suddenly get a bit darker? Is wow. the sun going down? Ah! All of your biggest fears start popping in your head. You suddenly hear snakes hissing, and is that the sound of some giant animal? A dinosaur, maybe? Oh no! Is there a chicken in here too? Your biggest phobias all gathered in one place. The ground starts to shake. You panic and turn around to flee. Oh no! The door's gone! You take a step, fall into a bottomless pit. Which brings me to the second thing to avoid. Try not to think about things that scare you or make you feel uncomfortable. We're all curious about scary scenarios, but your subconscious controls your dreams, and it knows all your suppressed fears. One tiny detail can escalate quickly and turn a nice lucid dream into a nightmare, or even wake you up. It might not be such a bad thing. So you bring your focus back to the nice things in the house, and the darkness disappears. Okay, good. The door's back too. You walk outside, back to the main road. Ah, it's a beautiful day. Oh, is that your old high school friend? Great, you were just thinking about her the other day. This will be a great chance to chat. Ah, stop right there. When it comes to lucid dreaming, the fewer <laughs> real-life places or people, the better. Lucid dreaming can make you feel like it's all real. It's not like you're going to wake up and think you actually talked to that person. But your subconscious will memorize how you felt about it. That can be a bit confusing if you end up meeting her in real life. Lucid dreams can create <laughs> fake memories, which can lead to all sorts of real-world issues. So, the house, the road, the thick forest next to it. Did your mind come up with all that by itself? Of course! Giraffes aren't usually so tall their heads poke through the clouds. You can't normally fly up to pick up an apple from that top branch. And elephants don't really wear awesome necklaces and earrings. Your dreamland doesn't have any limits. Hey, enjoy it while you're there. If you don't, you might end up inside a boring dream, where you slept through your alarm again. You could even have a lucid nightmare. Or maybe they're the same thing. If you get too excited right away, your lucid dream could finish too quickly. Yes, lucid dreaming is like the best VR simulation ever. So, duh, that's why you want to make it last. Sure, you can fly, see an epic waterfall, have magical powers, slide down a rainbow, enjoy a tropical paradise with coconuts and palms, but wait, wait, wait. Relax and try to stabilize your dream before you jump into any of that stuff. Start it off slowly with things that are more normal, 
like a road, house, meadow. Oh, hey, look, cute little rabbits and a deer. Much better to start your dream off that way. It takes some time to become skilled enough to do all those crazy things without waking up. You want it to be amazing and not just meh, boring or frustrating, or worst of all, end too soon. But also, keep moving. Don't aimlessly wander around. Forest, road, house, blah 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 sounds interesting at first, but eventually you should move on to more fun things. Make a plan. In lucid dreams, time goes slower than it does in reality. So use it well. Don't try too hard to control everything in your dream. First off, that takes a lot of practice. And second, let some things surprise you. Hopefully, not some phobias hidden in the dark corners of your subconscious. Keep your eyes open in the dream. How else are you going to see all the wonders of the dream world? Closing your eyes a lot can be a sign to your body that you want to wake up. It's helpful when you're stuck in a bad dream and can't make those scary creatures go away. But if you're in the good place… Don't spend too much time in your dreams, lucid or regular ones. They all happen during your REM, rapid eye movement sleep phase. In non-REM sleep, your eye movements, heart rate, and brain waves gradually slow down. And then, bam! REM phase comes around and your brain starts having fun. More than half the world's experience lucid dreams at least once, but few people can actually control them. Maybe that's not a bad thing, because knowing there's a place where you can do literally anything you imagine, whew, you might start to lose touch with reality. But when you're there, don't leave anything on your bucket list. How about flying? You're at the top of a high mountain, thick fluffy clouds are all around you. Where's the ground? You look down. Wahoo! In your dream, you're not afraid of heights. You feel adrenaline pumping through your body. Hey, go for it! Jump, spread your wings. Oh, by the way, you now have wings. Or what if, like me, you want to swim deep down into the ocean? You're on a small boat. You take a few deep breaths, feel the crisp air penetrating your lungs. One final inhale, you crouch down and splash! The best part? When you're dreaming, the salt water doesn't sting your eyes. When you think of astronauts going to space, you probably imagine those cool things they can do up there. First of all, it's flying like a superhero all the time. Astronauts hold onto rails and use their arm strength to move among modules. It probably takes some time to get used to this way of moving around, but in a couple of months in space, they can become real acrobats. They also read books, watch movies, or take awesome pictures of Earth through the cupola windows, which is a special viewing area on the space station. They also invent new games, like the one where they try to hit a target, or where they race one another from one end of the station to the other as fast as they can. And zero gravity sports must be so cool. Imagine playing soccer up there. It's the only way I'd ever be able to do a bicycle kick properly. It's cool how they eat or try to catch a bite from a floating spoon. But besides all these fun things, they need to sleep too. And that's not so easy in space. Not having gravity can be cool when you fool around and fly across your chamber, but it's definitely not that great when you're tired and can't wait for your head to hit the pillow. Because in space, that won't happen. Instead, astronauts have to sleep in small sleeping bags attached to the wall. This way they won't float around or potentially bump into things while they're sleeping. No sleepwalkers up there, only sleep floaters astronaut orbited our home planet a whopping 17 times in a spacecraft, proving humans could live, work, and sleep in space. But just because it's possible doesn't mean it's easy. Some astronauts describe their space capsule as a small garbage can, and the cabin itself is about the size of the front seat of a Volkswagen Beetle. Sleeping in space is very different from sleeping on Earth, to say the least. There is no up or down in space, so astronauts can choose any position they find comfortable. On the International Space Station, sleeping quarters are about the size of a phone booth. It's a tight space, and it doesn't look as cool as the rest of the things up there, but they make it work. Astronauts have to sleep near an air vent to make sure they have good ventilation. Breathing is trickier in space because the carbon dioxide they breathe out can form a bubble around their heads, which can be problematic since they may not get enough oxygen. Astronauts cover up windows to block out sunlight and may wear sleep masks just like some people on Earth do to block out light. 
The sun in space can be really bright, even with window shades, because there's no atmosphere to filter sunlight. Oh, those things we take for granted down here. Also, the space station orbits Earth every 90 minutes, so astronauts get to see a new sunrise every hour and a half. The station can be noisy too, since they have all those fans and other equipment, so astronauts sometimes wear earplugs to help them sleep. We all become grumpy if we don't get enough sleep, with or without gravity. Not just that. A lack of sleep can affect our blood pressure, immune system, balance, and health in general. And it's way trickier when you're not feeling well up there than on Earth. NASA schedules its astronauts for about 8 to 8.5 hours of sleep per day. But those who work on the ISS, on average, go with 6 hours of sleep because the space environment can disrupt their natural sleep patterns. That's why it's not so unusual to have insomnia and sleep deprivation when in space. Astronauts sometimes have changes in their schedules. They have to work long shifts or finish tasks assigned at night. All this works against good sleep. That's why NASA has sleep education and promotes special relaxation techniques to help crew members sleep better. Dreams and nightmares are as common in space as they are on Earth. You just can't get away from your mind making up different scenarios while you're sleeping. And you know that feeling when you first wake up all groggy and sluggish? It's like your body and brain are still trying to catch up and fully wake up. You might feel a little bit disoriented, plus it might be hard for you to think clearly or move quickly. It's called sleep inertia. This feeling usually goes away after a little while. But it's probably way harder to get rid of it in space because many astronauts have issues with it. And even if you had perfect conditions for sleep, just being in space would probably disrupt your body's natural sleep-wake cycle. Two things regulate this cycle, the S process and circadian rhythms. The S process controls whether we are asleep or awake throughout the day. In space, your body gets less deep sleep, which means it goes through some changes in the S process. Circadian rhythms help regulate our internal body clock as well. In space, where such cues as exposure to light and darkness are a complete mess, you can't simply set your alarm clock at 7 a.m. every morning. Hmm. At least up there, I'd have a good excuse for not doing this. To help astronauts adjust, NASA has added special lighting inside the space station, which mimics a regular day on Earth. They try to block out outside light at night and provide enough light during the day to help astronauts stay awake and sleep at the right times as much as possible. Astronauts need to be careful not to get exposed to blue light from electronic devices because that disrupts sleep too. Hmm, that tip sounds familiar. We need to figure out as many tricks as possible to get better sleep because we don't want to go on a mission to Mars and come to our potential new home all grumpy and moody. Plus, people who will go on these special space missions won't have as much space as astronauts on the ISS. Their quarters may not be like the comfortable bedrooms they have back on Earth, but they will still be dark, quiet, and best of all, private. At the same time, say goodbye to privacy on your way to the moon. On such missions, there will be less space for crew members to sleep. It will be like camping with your friends, but with not enough tents. And imagine jet lag in space. It usually hits astronauts even before they get to the space station. To help with this, they start adjusting their sleep schedules a few days before they launch into space. They change their sleeping and waking times to match the time of day and time zone of their launch location. Once they reach the space station, where astronauts from different countries work together, they all switch to using a common time called Greenwich Mean Time, GMT. This helps everyone synchronize their schedules because it's a middle ground time that can be easily understood by people from different parts of the world. So to help crew members have better sleep, scientists have simulated space missions on Earth. They have a special habitat called HERA at Johnson Space Center, which is almost the same size as a lunar base or spacecraft. Crews live there for certain periods and researchers study their sleep patterns and performance. NASA is planning a cool experiment called the Crew Health and Performance Exploration Analog, Shapea. The first mission is supposed to start soon with four crew members, a commander, a medical officer, a flight engineer, and a science officer, living in a habitat called Mars Dune Alpha at NASA's Johnson Space Center. They will live in the 3D printed habitat and exercise, cook, clean, do other things, and collect data just like they would on the Red Planet. I mean, we still have a decade or two till the first human missions on Mars, but we better hurry and prepare well. You're just about to fluff up your pillows and get dressed in your favorite pajamas. You then set your alarm for the next day. It's gonna ring in eight hours. Yeah, that should do the trick. Isn't that what your doctor suggested? But 
as the alarm starts ringing the next morning. You wake up feeling more tired than you were when you got into bed. Are those eight hours of recommended sleep just a myth? Sorry to break it to you, but as natural as sleep is for human beings, some of us can indeed be bad at snoozing. And it might have something to do with your circadian rhythm. Let me explain. The circadian rhythm is a natural internal process a lot of living organisms have. Think of it as the project manager of our bodies that's in charge of our schedules for falling asleep and waking up in the morning. It also helps to synchronize our bodies with the environment and the amount of light we're exposed to during the day. We're not the only creatures with a circadian rhythm. It's actually found in most living beings, including animals, plants, and even some bacteria. It plays a crucial role in regulating sleep, feeding needs, and even hormone production. During the day, the body produces hormones such as cortisol, which helps us stay alert and awake. At night, the body begins to produce melatonin, which makes us feel tired and promotes sleep. The circadian rhythm helps to let your body know when it's appropriate to generate these hormones, so it can function properly. When our circadian rhythm is messed up, like when we have jet lag or work irregular shifts at our jobs, our sleep patterns may become disrupted as well. What happens next? We can find it difficult to fall asleep, or we end up waking up frequently throughout the night. Or, as you might have experienced already, we end up feeling tired and groggy during the day, even if we've slept a reasonable number of hours during the night. To make sure our sleep pattern remains healthy, we need to have a consistent sleep schedule. It may also help if we expose ourselves to natural light during the day and avoid looking at screens, like our phone or tablet, before bedtime. By following these rules and ensuring that our body's internal clock is functioning okay, we can improve the quality of our sleep and overall well-being. We now know how important sleep is, but how much sleep do we actually need? The explanation is kind of complex. For starters, it has a lot to do with our age. When we're born, we need the most amount of sleep, somewhere around 14 to 17 hours of snooze time. As we grow older, by the time we're toddlers, we need 11 to 14 hours each day. Most teenagers need 8 to 10 hours of sleep, and by the time we're adults, we should be just fine with as little as seven hours. Apart from age, genetics also has a lot to do with our sleep needs. Some people are naturally more prone to needing more or less sleep. Also, people who lead more active lifestyles may need more sleep to recover and regenerate their bodies. High levels of stress can affect our sleep and cause people to need more sleep to feel rested. You might have also noticed that you need more sleep when you've caught a cold or when you've eaten too much. Do all of us need to fall asleep at the same hour to feel rested? You've surely heard of some people being night owls, while others are considered larks. Night owls tend to be more energetic and productive at night, while larks are more productive in the morning. Both types of people have their own unique habits and preferences and there's no right or wrong way to be a night owl or a lark. There are lots of questionnaires you can do online to see which category you fit in best, or you can test it for yourself at home. Try going to bed at different hours for a specific period of time and see which option fits best for your energy levels throughout the day. How about our sleeping position? Can that also influence how well rested we feel when waking up? Absolutely! And the most effective way to figure out what works best for you is to note everything down in a sleep diary. You'll need to record your sleep habits for at least a week or two to have the best results. Just make sure to switch between falling asleep on your back, your side, or your stomach each night. You don't have to change your favorite sleeping position if you're not having any issues, as long as you wake up feeling well rested. If you do experience problems, here are a couple of things you can try. For example, if you have neck pain, you'll have better rest while sleeping on your back or your side. 
You can also try using a thicker pillow when sleeping on your side and a thinner one when resting on your back. If your sinuses are the ones keeping you up at night, you can try sleeping on your back with your head a bit more elevated. A thicker pillow should do the trick too. If you have hip or back pain, try sleeping on your back, but place a pillow or a rolled up towel underneath your knees. It should reduce the pressure on your spine and help relieve the pain. We can't finish our list of facts about sleep without talking about the greatest love story of all. The one we all have with the snooze button, am I right? Does hitting the snooze button really give us some extra time to rest? This might also be the biggest myth of all. Not only is this information untrue, but hitting the snooze button can make us feel groggier in the long run even though, technically, we're sleeping more. Those 10-minute intervals of sleep we indulge in over and over again are not a good type of sleep. There simply isn't enough time for us to properly fall back into a deep sleep. Also, there is such a thing as actually sleeping too much, and oversleeping makes you even sleepier during the daytime and can affect your metabolism and your energy levels too. Not to mention, it can be a real nuisance for people sharing the same bed or room with you. Breaking up with the snooze button can be overwhelming, I know. But there are things you can do to soften the blow. For starters, set a realistic alarm. If you're more of a night owl, don't force yourself to wake up really early in the morning if you don't have to. Find a sleeping schedule that works for you and, most importantly, Stick to it. Follow up with getting out of bed as soon as you wake up. The change in posture will trigger the right chemicals in your body that remove your need to go back to sleep. If nothing seems to work, you can even move your alarm clock across the room. If you need to get out of bed to hit the snooze button, you'll be less likely to go back. Just because you don't have any of these problems doesn't mean your sleep patterns are doing great. Some people seem to think that just because they can fall asleep anywhere, they're good sleepers. But that can't be further away from the truth. On average, it should take us 5 to 15 minutes to fall asleep after we go to bed. If it takes longer for an extended amount of time, it may be a sign of insomnia. On the other hand, if falling asleep takes less than 5 minutes, you may be sleep deprived. And it can happen for a lot of different reasons like stress or even diet changes. It can also mean the sleep you're getting, even if it's the recommended seven to nine hours a night, is fragmented or disturbed. All right, Freddy Krueger lovers, this story is for you. Imagine the scene. You go to bed after a long, busy day, but in the middle of the night, your peaceful dream gets interrupted by an unexpected guest, and he looks like this. You've never seen this strange face before. He says something nice to you, or maybe he begins to threaten and even chase you all over the place. Also, he might just stare at you in silence with a mysterious Mona Lisa smile. You wake up the next morning. Whew, thank goodness it was just a dream. You scroll down your feed and suddenly, the very same face is looking back at you from the screen. Is that even possible? Well, yes and no. This man is an urban legend that has haunted many people's dreams in recent decades. According to the story, he first started appearing in dreams in the 1980s, and the first sketch of his face was created in a New York mental clinic in the winter of 2006. One patient of a well-known psychiatrist drew a portrait that eventually went viral. According to her, this man has been repeatedly appearing in her dreams, although she's never seen him in the waking world. And unlike Freddy, he acted pretty friendly and even offered her some advice on her private life. Soon after that, another patient noticed the portrait on the doctor's desk. He recognized that face and claimed to be dreaming of him regularly too. The second patient has never seen this man beyond the dream world either. The psychiatrist found this case curious and showed the portrait to some of his colleagues. Multiple patients also recognized this face and said they'd been seeing this man frequently in their own dreams. And from that time until today, 
thousands of alleged witnesses all over the globe reported the very same story in plenty of variations. A website creator from Italy, Andrea Natella, told the media that he first dreamt of this man in the winter of 2008. In his dream, he received a very specific message from this man who told him to create a website dedicated to solving the mystery of his appearance. According to Natella, he decided to follow this instruction and made an online platform aimed at collecting stories shared by dreamers all over the world. The website gained a lot of attention and soon became a viral sensation. Some people posted funny and cute stories. For example, this man appeared in a dream as a father figure, giving wise fortune cookie advice. Or as a romantic partner with gifts and flowers, taking the dreamer on a fancy date. One of the witnesses claimed to have dreamt about this man being a school teacher from Brazil with six fingers on his right hand. But others reported experiencing some creepy nightmares that made them wake up shaking and sweating. There's little information about the voice of this mysterious guy, perhaps because it's typically harder for the human brain to remember sounds from dreams compared to pictures. However, there are some common trends in this man's message, such as telling dreamers to go north. Of course, thousands of people tried to find an actual living human that looks exactly like this man. They sent Natella many letters with different guesses, from ordinary people from the block to celebrities. Some suggested movie characters like The Man from Another Place from Twin Peaks. English composer Andrew Lloyd Webber also joined the list and even an Indian guru named Arud Kanan Aya. But despite the variety of wild guesses and funny memes, the original This Man was never found. Over the years, many brave minds tried to crack this mystery, which was getting more and more viral, and multiple theories popped up. Let's take a look at some of them. Remember the iconic dream surfer played by Leonardo DiCaprio? Well, the first theory is kind of similar to the famous movie plot. It suggests that this man is a real person who can enter people's dreams using some secret psychological skills. Unfortunately, this theory has the lowest scientific credibility, which isn't surprising. Unmasking is the last thing that dream surfers need, right? While some believed that this man is a superhero who shows his actual life face, others thought he looked completely different in the waking world. Meanwhile, more pessimistic individuals suspected a global brainwashing experiment going on behind those innocent, fluffy eyebrows. But since the dream space is one of the most poorly explored territories, it's pretty hard to get solid evidence to support any of these ideas. Another popular explanation is based on Carl Jung's psychoanalytical theory. It suggests that this man is an archetypal image from the collective unconscious. It visits the dreamer to point at particularly sensitive subjects and helps release psychic power to cope with hard times. Some take mysticism to the next level and associate this man with the universal consciousness. Those who adhere to this theory believe that their creator takes this specific form to communicate through their dreams. That's why the orders they receive from him must be followed undoubtedly. Pretty scary, huh? Science offers a simpler explanation, though. This theory is a mix of psychology and sociology. It claims that the whole this man phenomenon has arisen and developed thanks to imitation. People who come across the picture and his story get deeply impressed. And after that, they just begin seeing him in their dreams. In simple words, he only haunts those who make him a thing. And there's another curious explanation which is based on humans' tendency to forget faces from their dreams. Let's say you're dreaming of your favorite actor. Then he turns into your uncle. And then he smoothly takes the form of your yoga teacher, who you only met once 10 years ago. This character tells you something important or just leaves some specific emotional impression. You wake up in the morning still feeling this aftertaste but you have no clue who exactly you were dreaming of. That's when the daytime recognition theory steps in. It claims that the brain uses this man's face to fill the void when the person is trying to remember the dream in a waking state. It chooses this particular face just because the dreamer remembers it more vividly. 
Okay, but this explanation only works for those who dreamt of this man after seeing his portrait. But what about those who didn't? Can the human brain actually create any new faces in dreams? According to science, the answer is no. Every individual you dream of has been someone you have either known or merely came across. Of course, you may dream of someone you barely recognize because you've seen them only once. But the brain remembers everything. It keeps a library of all the hundreds of thousands of faces that you see every day. So, according to science, this man is either your old friend or a system bug. As creepy as it sounds. Are you scared yet? Take it easy. In 2010, the website creator Andrea Natelli made a post where he confessed that the story of this man was just a prank. Nutella never verified whether this prank had a commercial purpose, but still, he managed to gain attention in Hollywood. A production company named Ghost House Pictures purchased this man's website domain, and in 2010, they announced plans to make a horror movie based on this epic viral trend. Their press release promised a story about a common man who discovers that people he has never met are seeing him in their dreams. And now he's on a mission to find out why he's the source of nightmares happening all over the globe. However, no further statements about the movie have ever since been made. Is it because of business calculations or this man's curse? I guess we'll never know. Prank or not, people to this day keep on sharing fresh stories about this man visiting them in their dreams. There are more urban legends about haunted dreams than you don't want to Google before bedtime. But for now, have a good night, my curious friends. You're alone in a dark alleyway when you hear a lion's roar. Peeking out of the shadows, the king of the jungle stares at your face and runs directly towards you. You try sprinting to get away from him, but it looks like your legs and arms are moving through jello-like air. That's when you spot an old phone booth and manage to get inside it. But how do you even call anyone in one of these things? Where's your smartphone? The world of dreams is a crazy one, to say the least. It's a safe place to live out our deepest and darkest fears. But regardless of what common knowledge says, it's not where all things are possible. For example, you'll most likely never dream of your smartphone, and you'll have a pretty hard time trying to run. Why though? Scientists are still studying why humans dream, so there's a lot we don't know about the science of dreaming just yet. But there's a theory that helps to explain why we have a hard time dreaming of modern things, such as smartphones, computers, and even airplanes. It's called the Threat Simulation Hypothesis. Let's call it the TSH. This theory says that by living our deepest fears and anxieties through our dreams, we are practicing how we would react to them in real life. That's why so many people relive traumatic experiences in dream states. The brain is trying to condition us to survive threatening situations by practicing them out in a safe environment, aka the sleeping state. So, if you dream you're being chased in the woods by a bear or you're trying to finish that math exam without studying, this is your brain anticipating possible reactions by trying them out in a dream state first. It makes you sharp and aware in case these things do happen to you in real life. Should we thank our brains for this? I think so, yeah. But that's just one half of the story. Scientists also argue that since the dream state evolved as a defense mechanism, we tend to dream about situations that were dangerous to our ancestors. So, modern technologies such as computers and smartphones will rarely appear in people's dreams. Notice I said rarely? That means it's not universal. According to an analysis of 16,000 dream reports, Smartphones do seem to appear in 3.55% of women's dreams, while computers appeared in only 1.2%. It's a very small number, but still, some people have the luxury or the haunt of dreaming about their cell phone. But why can't we run though? I don't know about you, but I'm always trying and failing to run in my dreams. There are a couple of reasons why that might happen. Some dream experts suggest that it might be because, when we're sleeping, our brain is active, but our muscles are relaxed and lying still. Some conflicting signals may happen, which results in the running through water movement we feel in a dream state. 
Another theory says that when we're dreaming, we're engaging in a constant act of world building. Our brain is building the scenarios we're engaging with, processing all the information that's unfolding before us. If we started running, maybe the brain wouldn't be able to keep up with the world building. So our dream avatars are slowed down to a speed that is compatible with the brain's processing speed. You're flying above crystalline sea waters. The wind is brushing through your hair. You look around, and there's a pig-faced pelican smiling at you. It approaches you and starts to tickle your nose with its feathers. You <laughs> laugh, but you can't feel a thing. What's up with that? Here's a fun fact. Even lucid dreamers can't feel ticklish when they're dreaming. In case you don't know, lucid dreaming happens when a person is aware that they're dreaming and starts to constantly narrate the course of their dreams. It's where you get to be the scriptwriter and director of your own life. Scientists speculate that lucid dreaming is not a state of sleep, but rather a state of wakefulness where the person can establish a so-called two-way communication between dreaming and real life. Does this remind you a little bit of the movie Inception? If it does, that's because Christopher Nolan took inspiration from his experience with lucid dreaming in order to write this movie. Anyways, in a study published by a neuroscience journal, researchers worked with lucid dreamers to see if they could tickle themselves <laughs> or be tickled by other characters in their dreams. And they found something quite amazing. Dreamers <laughs> couldn't feel the tickles. Researchers think this suggests that when we're dreaming, the part of the brain that reacts to stimuli is minimized. And let's face it, that's a good thing when you're dreaming you're stuck inside a house catching fire, right? Now let's say you just woke up from an agitated dream. You spent the night dreaming you were at a rock concert where the band members were your childhood stuffed animals. You remember all the minor details of the dream, but you can't seem to remember any of the melodies the teddy bear band was singing. Why is that so? Most people don't or can't dream of music. But that seems so strange since music is a huge part of our daily lives. The only ones who do seem to dream and remember the soundtrack of their sleeping lives are musicians. To understand this a bit more, we have to look at another dream theory. In 1983, scientists came up with a neurobiological theory called reverse learning. This theory says that during our REM sleep cycles, the neocortex reviews our daily neural connections and decides what to do with them. That's when our short-term memory is tucked away in the long-term memory section of our brain. And it's also the moment when our brain cleans up. It dumps the unnecessary neural connections and tries to keep the important ones. In this theory, dreams are the result of this unlearning process. Say you've been dealing with some anxiety regarding your work. You suspect you might get fired and that's all you think about. Your brain makes up different make-believe scenarios playing out a series of interactions that end up never happening in real life. Some of these neural connections will be deleted from your brain database while you sleep. This is what might happen to music. The dreaming mind treats music as parasitic and non-essential, preventing it from ever making it to the long-term memory pile. If you think about it, our brain kind of protects us from having that cheesy melody stuck with us for eternity. Let's do a quick thought exercise. Consider that an average human being spends about two hours dreaming every night. That means by the time that you're 80 years old, you'll have dreamed the equivalent of 60,000 hours. That's 10 years worth of dreaming. Crazy, huh? Now imagine if our brains didn't erase a cheesy melody we listened to more times than we would have liked. I can't even begin to imagine the overload of information our brains would have been able to stock. Moving on, you know what else you can't do while you're dreaming? Experience things in real time. We just said we spend an average of two hours dreaming each night, but on average, we sleep around eight hours, and it does feel like we spent all those hours dreaming. According to recent research, a simple action that might take five minutes in waking life to be performed can take much longer in a dream. They tested this out with lucid dreamers, where scientists would ask them to perform a task and signal when they're done, while the researchers timed everything. Perhaps that's why we get the impression we dream for 8 hours straight every night. Tell me one thing though, how many of you even remember your dreams? According to statistics, half of us remember at least one dream a week. 
and women are more likely to remember their dreams compared to men. Care to tell us about any recent dreams of yours?